Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome, 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 welcome to the virtual chapter for October 2021. It's a very scary Halloween month, as you will see as we go along. Uh, I am sitting in front of uh, in front of the uh, uh, the hot springs at uh, Esalen, uh, the uh, Slates Hot Springs. Uh, which is a state park there, and uh, Esalen sort of grew up around it. We're going to talk about Esalen a little bit later in the evening, but I just thought I would introduce the background because it's just so lovely. Uh, I wish I were actually out there in three dimensions because because uh, why not? And the hot tubs are empty. We we could gather there and we could have a great uh, a great program. So here we are for our October meeting. Our guest this evening is going to be Shelley Stockwell, who is gonna talk with us about Stanislav Grof and holotrophic breathing and the training and stuff that she had there. Uh, this is a special episode tonight because we're really looking at the roots of, uh, of this strange thing that Alan, uh, Aldous Huxley called the uh, human potentialities uh, or the human potential movement, as some of you know it. Some of you were too young to even remember that thing. It was before the new age movement. <laughs> <laughs> which comes just a little bit later uh, and uh, what exciting times uh, in the background so just a couple of things we need to tell you about here as we start out first of all um, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen say hello Karen hello hello Karen and hello Michael and everybody who came tonight notice it is our Halloween episode we'd like to keep these evergreen but I just wanted to make this one very special tonight yeah. Well, it is our Halloween episode, and yet we also have, before we get uh, a little too frivolous, we have some sort of serious news from within our community, a, a sad event that has taken place. And, and Karen, I'm going to let you talk about that, if you will. Well, I will do that, but you know what? I can't do that with this. Um, you can't do that with the mask on. I can't do it with a mask on. It's just not appropriate. So let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, I will continue to be a witchy woman, but... I would, I'm sure that uh, most of you have heard by now that our colleague, uh, Tony Macri Reiner was killed over the weekend. She was in her home. Her husband was there, her daughter, her grandchild, and there was a home invader. Somebody broke into the home and there was Tony trying to help everybody, the kid. They've got a juvenile arrested. Of course, we don't know all the details yet, but there was a kid who shot her and she was taken to the hospital in critical condition and died overnight, uh, died that night. Uh, she lives in a very upscale, wonderful neighborhood. She is a wonderful, wonderful woman. All of her neighbors said everybody who knew her loved her. If you ever met Tony, you were in that group too. She was just a very fascinating woman. And um, it's kind of put a, put a damper on the last couple of days, just hearing about that and seeing it on the internet. And uh, Bob Burns knew her well and has put some things on the internet. I mean, it's gone international because Tony was really a wonderful woman. So many of us knew her and, and um, worked with her and did other things with her. She was very, very active in her community and on the hypnosis forums and in ICBCH and at HypnoThought. She was very, very active. She was certifying brand new baby hypnotists and doing great things. Um, she was to us, of course, a hypnotherapist. Uh, it's very interesting that when the news first came out in our community, it came out that hypnotherapist Tony Macri Reiner was uh, killed in her home. And the uh, article, I, I was in touch with the um, Indianapolis star. She's from Indianapolis, Indiana, and it happened in Indianapolis. And I posted it on our Mid-America Hypnosis Conference uh, Facebook page. And the Indianapolis star contacted me to get information on her. And I told them some things and said where they could go to find other things, her LinkedIn, Facebook, other, other places and people they could talk to. And she was not listed as hypnotherapist, Tony Macri Riney. She was listed as Tony Macri Riney, a grandmother who very much loved her grandchildren. And it, it's hard for me to even say that because that is the truth. That's what everybody knew her as. She was also a potter. She made ceramics and pottery. Her father was a hypnotist. And so she grew up with it. And when she was in um, elementary and grade school, it was, I mean, uh, middle school, it was a little bit embarrassing to her because you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, you don't want anything weird going on around you. And that was kind of weird. And, um, so she didn't want any part of that. She went into being a potter. And then later on, she was reading something and said, I know how to do that. I can do that. I understand this. And she became certified. And then that was what she has done for the last uh, probably decade. But 
not only was she a hypnotherapist and a wonderful woman, she was a grandmother and she left behind a family that really loves her. So that's my spiel on Tony. She'll be missed in the entire community. She'll be missed. She will be missed indeed. So uh, how does one segue from that? Uh, uh, other than on to, we have a calendar to discuss to let you know about some things that are coming up because uh, the, the community is uh, continuing, of course, to move and to go forward and the next thing and the next thing. And there's always something, isn't there? As a matter of fact, Karen Hand, uh, we are just around the corner from a major event in Chicago, Illinois. You might tell us about that. Well, it's a major event internationally. Let's realize it's no longer the Chicago convention this year. It's the world convention because it's the Mid-America Virtual Hypnosis Conference. And we have a lot of presenters here. Grant will be there presenting. Uh, Shelly will be hosting a room and presenting a whole bunch of stuff. And Shelly's going to do a class on hypno happiness. I can hardly wait. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Michael, of course, will be presenting. Michael's going to talk about dreams and belief change. And he'll even in, we have a hospitality suite that runs all day, but we had kind of off the, um, off the path things. And Michael will be there uh, analyzing dreams for people who come in. Uh, we've just got a whole bunch. Janet Rapala is going to be doing hypno massage there. We've got all sorts of stuff going on and you can still join us. Uh, you can go to mid-americaconference.com and you can get registration. You can see uh, the whole list of presenters. It begins Friday and ends Sunday. We end on Sunday on Sunday with a group past life regression with Paula Ron, Sophia Kramer, and Peter Blum will be doing uh, singing bowls in the background as that happens. So it's a pretty phenomenal thing. We did that last year as well when it was on Zoom. And it was just incredible, the experience that one can have, even all of, and the energy that we all shared in that room, even though we were so far away. Mid-America Hypnosis Conference, it's this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you can still join. And if you can't attend every day, that's okay. We give you a download of the entire conference. You'll have till mid-January to either watch the whole thing or download all of it and keep it forever. Mid-americaconference.com. Hope to see you there. Cool. You know, the thing that I'm most looking forward to is a group past life regression, because I think it'd be great if we go into a past life regression and find a time when we were all together once before. There at Esalen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that could be it. That would be that would be just amazing. Uh, group regression is an interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah. So, well, great. And, and a couple other things uh, here in Florida, uh, the 12th, 13th and 14th of November is the meeting of the Hypnosis Education Association. Uh, we're all excited. Now, last year, we, we had our meeting online and, uh, and went virtual uh, really due to COVID. And, and in fact, uh, and the meeting before that and the meeting before that. So, uh, so this is the first time we've had a chance to be together, uh, together again in one place in, in a couple of years. Uh, so for those of you who are not local, I apologize that we're not running it on Zoom or, any, or anything like that. Um, but uh, recordings are being made at the very least. Uh, and if you have a chance to pop down to Florida, it's a beautiful time of the year to be here because I understand that it's like crazy things like 51 degrees in Chicago, for instance, where I'm from, you know, that's uh, that's. It like, was cold today. Yeah. It was cold today. It's been warm up until today, but it was cold today. Yeah. So come on down to Florida, uh, November 12th, 13th, and 14th. It'll be a great weekend. Jason Lynette is newly a resident of Orlando, and uh, he's going to be one of our speakers. I'm going to I'm going to be a speaker. Peter Blum, whose photograph or whose who's painting rather you saw earlier, uh, is uh, is coming down uh, to present for us as well. It's just going to be a great time. Patty Scott, who's uh, who's online here, uh, is going to be presenting as well. By the way, Patty is the vice president of this particular organization. And uh, she's the, uh, the president in charge of Vice. I am the president of this organization for the second time in 20 some, in 20 some years. Uh, I did this a long time ago. Uh, it's great to be back doing this and, and it's really exciting. So I hope that you guys who, who uh, are in other places have local chapters and local organizations and ways to actually get together with people that you, know, you can sit over supper with because uh, that's, that's really such a wonderful thing. And to me, one of the uh, one thing that's just made all the difference in the world for me. Uh, when I first started doing hypnosis, I came to Florida, and uh, you know I thought I was the only one in the village. 
uh, and, and lo and behold, you know, this organization popped up and, uh, and it has just been there for me for, for over 20 years. So I'm, uh, I'm just really a fan of, uh, of things like that. So, so there's that. And also on the seventh, from the 17th to the 21st of November, so there's still a little bit of time left for you to consider and get involved. Uh, I am running once again, the, uh, IACT, uh, certified master trainer training. Uh, we are doing that online. It's five consecutive days from the 17th to the 21st. Uh, we do it twice a year. We do it online uh, in uh, in November, which we'll do it again like next November. And then we do it live uh, around the weekend of the uh, IACT conference, which is in May this, uh, uh, this next year. So that's just about all that I can think of other than to remind you, you can get CEUs for spending time with us tonight. So uh, in order to get them, if you're a member of IACT or IMDHA, at least uh, go out to the website. And when you log in with your, uh, with your member, you know, your member information, there's a screen that pops up where you can just say, I spent uh, a few hours with uh, Karen and Michael and Shelly and all these other lovely people. And uh, I want to be compensated and they will, uh, they will give you some, uh, some credit for that. Uh, IHF is always very good about uh, giving, yes, CEUs for this, I, uh, ICBCH does, and NGH will too, and if they give you a problem about it, remind them that I am a certified instructor with NGH as well, so uh, they have, there's no reason why you wouldn't get CEUs by, for attending this. Great. All right. Well then, uh, anything else from you, Karen? Um, I, you know what, as I think of it, I'll just pop in. Okay. I'm actually very excited to hear about Esalen because I'm going to admit something and, and you can be aghast if you'd like. I have heard Michael speak about Esalen. I think I've even heard Shelly talk about it once or twice. And I really don't get it. I really don't know what it's all about, how all of this got started. And I would love to say that I'm a little too young for it. I don't think that that's actually the case. But, uh, <laughs> but at any rate, I'm excited, very excited, Michael, to hear you talk about this and tell us all about it. Well, Karen, you are a little too young for it because I don't know where you were in 1962, but I was 10. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, so a little, a little too young for some of it, but it got better and so did I. So, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and we all have re reaped the benefits of Esalen. So Esalen Institute is, uh, is up above uh, Big Sur in California. Here's a picture, as I said, behind uh, where you can see some uh, hot tubs. Uh, actually, there are natural hot springs there. It was a state park way back when called Slate's Hot Springs. Uh, a fellow named Slate homesteaded it back in the 1840s or something like that. <clears throat> and, uh, and somewhere around the turn of the century, I'm not quite sure, it changed hands and came into the hands of a man named Murphy, who never successfully got the name changed. But, uh, but it, was, uh, it was Murphy's place for, for quite a while. <clears throat> and this Murphy that I'm talking about just happens to be the grandfather or maybe even the great grandfather of Michael Murphy, who was one of the two founders of Esalen. In 1962, um, Michael Murphy and Dick Pine, who had both been students at Stanford uh, in psychology, and weirdly enough, they didn't know each other at Stanford, but they had both come out of Stanford uh, in, in psych. They graduated from Stanford, and Michael went on to study with uh, Sri Aurobindo and uh, looked into some Eastern mysticism and Taoism and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and Dick uh, went to Harvard to pursue a graduate degree there. And somewhere in his experience, and I'm afraid I don't know exactly when, <clears throat> his parents had him uh, committed, uh, involuntary uh, commitment to a, a mental institution. And, and we're talking about something that happened in the late 50s. So if you can think about mental institutions and what they might have been in the late 50s, uh, I think this was a life changing event uh, for Dick. And, um, and he came back out to California the, the, uh, it, and hooked up finally with uh, Michael, who was doing some lectures in the area at the same time. And Dick was developing his own sort of approaches to psychology and, 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 and Gestalt was just beginning to bubble up and a whole lot of really amazing things were happening. And, and Karen, because, because you mentioned not being too clear about this, one of the things I will tell you in my opinion, it's, it's an opinion, of course, it's highly subjective, <clears throat> but I think of Esalen as being the epicenter of this massive explosion that, uh, you know, that, that followed in its wake. Uh, so they started this place in 1962. It is a, a retreat center and an intentional community focusing on humanistic uh, alternative education. 
So they founded this place to just support alternative methods for exploring human consciousness. Uh, Aldous Huxley had given a lecture that uh, really impressed Michael Murphy in 1960 or so, where he referred to <coughs> human potentialities. It was the first place that we had heard that word. <coughs> and uh, and uh, and really, Esselin took off and ran with it. They uh, basically, it, it was, it was kind of like they, they were a kid with a new toy, you know, and they were trying to figure out what else can I do with this? What else can I do with this? Uh, and, and really invited massive exploration. All the therapy groups, tea groups, encounter groups, all of that stuff that we hear about these days when we look back at that period of the, of the 60s and stuff, uh, really uh, sort of had its life spring out of, uh, out of Esalen uh, largely. The, the um, what do I want to tell you? Um, so I would say it really became the epicenter, in fact, of the practices and beliefs that are the basis of what later became called the, the New Age movement. Uh, they studied Eastern religions and philosophy. They studied alternative medicine, mind and body interventions, and Gestalt practices. And uh, let's see, Alan Watts, this is cool, because Alan Watts is one of my favorite people in the world. Alan Watts gave his first lecture, gave the first lecture, not his first lecture. He had spoken before this, but gave the first lecture at Esalen in 1962. And, um, and through the years, Esalen became a who's who of, of the human potential movement. Gregory Bateson, Virginia Huxley, Timothy Leary, uh, Richard Alpert, that is Ram Das, Stanley Krippner, some of you might know about him, Terrence McKenna, I bet many of you have heard of Terrence, Linus Pauling, Carl Rogers, probably Mr. Rogers as well, uh, B.F. Skinner, Ansel Adams, and Joan Baez. <laughs> it's just a short list you know, uh, of names that, that pop up really quickly when you think of Esalen. In fact, in 1964, Joan Baez did a, a program there called the New, uh, the New Folk Music. And, uh, and it developed into this music series and art series that, uh, that continued to grow at Esalen. And they ran concerts every single year. And in 1968, the week after Woodstock, Joan and a whole lot of other folks from Woodstock pilgrimaged out to uh, Esalen and uh, you know, spent some time in the hot tubs and a great deal of time, you know, uh, running a, a lovely special concert that is documented. There's, there's, I think you can find uh, clips from this uh, event, by the way, uh, on YouTube. So you might uh, might look if you have an interest in that. But um, but through the years, the the number of people that uh, I mean, I mentioned a whole lot of names of folks that were there, but there were certain people that they actually had in residence and kept them there for some while. Uh, Fritz Perls, most notably, uh, uh, taught Gestalt therapy uh, at Esalen for a number of years. Uh, Joseph Campbell was in residence there. So those of you who have an interest in Joseph and, uh, and mythology, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he did a lot of work there. Gregory Bateson, uh, who was the inspiration, aside from Milton Erickson, to uh, Van Lern Grinder, for instance, in, in neurolinguistic programming. Stanislav Graf, who we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, the developer of holotropic uh, breathwork. Uh, was in residence there. Sam Keen, some of you know Sam Keen, uh, Ida Rolf, uh, Virginia Satir, I mentioned, and Alan Watts, just to name a few. So, so all of these incredible luminaries and that this place just opened itself up to. Uh, and, uh, and anything alternative, it seems to be, uh, you know, uh, came through Esalen at some point. Uh, it is my understanding. I, I vaguely remember reading some articles where they were doing some exploration with what we've come to call deep trans identification. Uh, so they had a um, they had a, a small child or a young child rather who was composing music like Mozart, you know, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and I believe a painter that was painting Monets uh, and stuff. Uh, some really fascinating things. Uh, uh, the the philosophy I think of Esalen was to be open to and inviting to things that. Uh, that were different. As a matter of fact, they even ran some seminars where the people that were running the seminars were contesting the very premises upon which Esalen was built as well. So, so uh, wide open and available and, and just a, a clean, beautiful space um, that, that, that functioned really well for all of these years. Uh, in 2017, a uh, stretch of the highway was washed out. And, uh, and Esalen actually lost its connection to, uh, to the main roads and stuff for a while. And they were, uh, they were sort of held back for, I think, about a year or so. But I know that in the last year, they've done uh, 500 or some seminars and workshops. Uh, and they continue to, uh, to do great work today. So look up their website if you, if you have an interest. Uh, you might want to go out there and spend some time because uh, 
it's just fascinating stuff. So, so there we go. Those are all the headlines. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I can't go into detail on any of those topics. But here's the thing. In, in, in my own experience, I, I went to college in 1970. So now Esalen was already, you know, eight years old. And I remember, uh, and I was a pre-seminary student, and I remember picking up a book by a fellow who you might know by the name of Ram Das that wanted me to be there then. Uh, so I was there then, and, uh, and through Ram Das, I started finding connections to other things and another author and another teacher and another, you know, another idea, another movement that was coming, you know, coming forward. Eventually, I find, found myself connected with uh, an organization called EST that some of you might be familiar with, uh, Cattle Therapy for Adults. Uh, but, but, uh, but truly a great experience. And these are all these kind of things all really, I think, can trace their sources to some of the things that were happening at Esalen. So wherever it is you find yourself on the spectrum of the human potential movement, evolved then into the new age movement and certainly having an influence in our community, uh, particularly those of us that do more esoteric, you know, kinds of things. Um, we, we, you know, we owe them an incredible, uh, incredible debt. So if you don't know about Esalen, look up some more stuff because there's just more that I can tell you and, and every little avenue that you go down will teach you something else new and something else uh, wonderful. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what I have to tell you about Esalen to introduce you to it. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our guest who has some firsthand experiences of Esalen, and she can tell you some things about it as well. But we're also going to talk with her about Stan Groff, and I'm really excited about that. I have been looking so forward to this evening because I asked uh, Shelly about this a couple of months ago, and I thought, you know, instead of our usual stuff, Let's talk about this one very particular, that, that, that I know you to be somebody who has had an experience with this particular great teacher. Uh, and uh, wouldn't it be nice to spend some time really talking about that and about the, the kind of things that, that happened around it. So, <clears throat> so without further ado, Shelly, I know your microphone is, I hope your microphone is open. It really ought to be. I would introduce you formally, but I just can't think of anything to say particularly other than the fact that you are the lady who is in charge of everything at the, uh, uh, at the IHS, and, or IHF rather, and, uh, and I have known you for a long time. You are somebody that is so loved in this community and appreciated everywhere. Uh, and and uh, you know, I don't know how you can be around the hypnosis community without already knowing Shelley Stockwell, but uh, if you don't, uh, here she is with us tonight. So hi, Shelley. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience at Esalen, and then we'll talk about Stan Groff and Christina Groff, because they were a couple. It wasn't just Stan. But in those days, males got the credit, and the women didn't always get the credit. And that was one of the things that happened in the humanistic psychology movement. This whole Esalen was the birth of humanistic psychology and this humanistic transpersonal approach to life. Now, transpersonal means that you go beyond your personality to an expanded awareness of your consciousness. And all the greats came up to Esalen. I was uh, in college in 1962 at Berkeley. Now, Berkeley at that 1962 was when the free speech movement was happening. And here I was fresh out of high school at Berkeley, uh, exposed to the free speech movement. And then the buzz happened about Esalen. And so I became very curious. I did tell one of my friends, you know, I'm really curious about Esalen. And he said, oh, no, you shouldn't go there. You're not, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're not enlightened enough to go which of course made me want to go. <laughs> and at that moment, I made a decision, I'm going to Esalen because I'm, I'm not enlightened enough to go. So I think my first venture to Esalen was probably 1967. And in 1967, I remember arriving at the property and was quite surprised to see a bunch of naked volleyball players. And there were people running around naked everywhere. And that was interesting, or as Alice in Wonderland would say, curiouser and curiouser. And uh, 
and the food was amazing. They grew their own food and the hot tubs were beautiful. And um, I took an open encounter class. Now, for those of you, any of you ever participated in an encounter group? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you did that. Okay, an encounter group was a very, it was a very happening thing in the 70s, the 60s. And what we would do is we would sit in a circle and we would have no script and no agenda. And I had actually been in my first encounter group in high school. I was selected to represent my high school with a group of other high school kids. And we just sat in a group for the weekend. And they, we had psychologists watching us and evaluating group dynamics. Very experiential and very strange, really, for a kid my age. And uh, I had my first enlightenment experience, actually, in high school at that encounter group. So when I got to Esalen, it wasn't that strange after all, because we we're just doing another encounter group. It's called Open Encounter. And we had a couple of leaders, and, and we would do different things, exercises. And I, one thing that stands out for me, which you'll find fascinating, I suspect, is after several days together, maybe three or four days, they said, well, we're, tonight we're going to break all the barriers. And so we're going to all get together. We're about 40 of us and we're all going to get together. And so everybody take off your clothes. <laughs> well, I just was shocked. I don't know why, but I was shocked. And I remember thinking, I don't know, I really want to do this. And we were in a group, we were put in groups of people we felt comfortable with. So I was with a group of four other people. And I remember some people across the room saying, we don't want to do this. How dare you tell us we have to do that? We don't want to do that. They said, anybody who doesn't want to do it, please form a group over there. And they went over there and they formed a group. And as I was taking off one sock very slowly, because I was really not committed to this yet, I looked over at the group that had been complaining and they were all stark naked already. <laughs> they were the first ones to disrobe. I thought that was interesting. Finally, the whole room was naked. And now we had an assignment. It was a very interesting assignment. And I will tell you, it did break down all barriers because our job was to share with our little pod the parts of our body we were most proud of and most embarrassed about. And everyone proceeded to do that. And it was the weirdest thing because if there was a part of your body you were ashamed of, everyone else in the group went, oh, I always liked a pear-shaped butt or whatever. <laughs> they were celebrating each other. And it was quite an interesting happenstance of celebration. Afterwards, when it was all over, we were quite a bit closer indeed. We, we did make a, a deeper connection uh, to each other. And we, we put our we put our robes clothes back on. And the next day there were no barriers because a lot of people hide behind clothes. We're ashamed of things, we're embarrassed of things. But you know, when you've just seen each other warts and all, and everybody has a body, it it did break down a whole lot of barriers. So I, I became an Esalen junkie. I do remember that one of my first things that stood out for me at these encounter groups were people talking about enlightenment experiences. Now, how many of you here have had an enlightenment experience? Raise your hand if you think you've had one. Okay, so a lot of you have, and that's very cool. Well, I had not that I knew of anyway. Maybe I did, but I didn't call it that. So I thought that was very mystical and very mysterious that you'd have an enlightenment experience. And so as luck would have it, a few years went by, and I had been up there many times taking different classes. And I, as luck would have it, I had, I was pregnant with my husband and our child. Turned out I had a miscarriage. I miscarried twins. And it was very devastating at the time. I didn't even know they were twins till they, till they died. And I had to carry them around for a couple of months because my doctor wanted me to expel them naturally. Well, that didn't happen, but I was in this kind of warp, time warp, carrying around two dying fetuses. And at that time, I already joined TWA as a flight attendant. And 
I had time off because I was going through this event. I had the fetuses removed and I picked up the Esalen catalog and it said, there's a class at Esalen called Death and Rebirth. And it just happened to be that I had time off. I was on a leave. Why not go up there? So I went to Esalen Institute to take a class called Death and Rebirth. And the people facilitating it were Christina and Stanislav Groff, a married couple who've been married a long time at that point and very, very loving couple. She was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She's deceased now. He's still alive. And they explained that we were going to do some deep sustained breathing to provocative music and that we should expect enlightenment experiences or we could expect what they called kundalini rising. Has anybody here ever heard about the kundalini? Raise your hand if you know what that is or you kind of a vague notion. Yeah. Well, the kundalini has signposts and it's the experience written about in ancient Sanskrit of enlightenment through the nervous system. So some of the signposts of the Kundalini would be, how many of you, raise your hand, if you ever felt like you had body sensations that move through you really quickly and then they're gone. Anybody have that experience? Okay, that's one signpost. Another is, let me think. Um, how about you feel discomfort and suddenly you feel comfortable, discomfort, comfort. It's sort of hot and cold, weird stuff like that. Sometimes you have a, a disconnect, like you're, you're in your body, but you're not in your body. You're watching your body. It's like you're outside watching yourself. How many of you have had that one? So that's another signpost of the Kundalini. Or um, you, sometimes you get increased ESP. You know, you sort of know something's going to happen before anybody had that one. Just all of a sudden, you have more ESP. Um, time distortion, time may speed up, it may slow down. There's all of these weird things. And I'm getting a little uncomfortable in this idea of, I don't want to have all these body sensations and feel weird. I'm just there because my twins died and I'm just there to breathe or whatever. I don't want to participate. So Stan and Christina Groff proceed to tell us the story of their lives. Stan tells us the story that he was raised in Czechoslovakia and that uh, he is a psychiatrist and he is a psychotherapist. He studied all of the Freudian psychology. And he was very, very interested in Czechoslovakia in doing research with LSD. And he had found that prisoners and people in mental hospitals when given LSD would often have profound enlightenment experiences and that they would be changed forever from the enlightenment experience of doing the hallucinogenic drugs. But as things would have it, Czechoslovakia became communist and all the books on Freud were burned. And then of course, LSD was, uh, first of all, psychology was banned in Czechoslovakia. He came to America and was gonna do his LSD research in America, but then LSD was banned. And so he realized that one of the things that he had noticed during these episodes with the experimentation volunteers <laughs> was that they would often go into very rapid, interesting breathing patterns. And they would go into altered states and the altered states were rather profound. They would often be nonverbal, mainly nonverbal. And these altered states would bring about a resulting profound clarity of their life's purpose, their point of being here. And it was really fascinating to him. And so he started developing the holotropic breathing, which is deep sustained breathing using provocative music. And the breathing is, goes like this. And you proceed to breathe like that for anywhere from an hour to three hours. Now, I don't know if that causes over oxygenation or oxygen deprivation. I'm not sure. 
but the process itself was I found quite annoying at first and the music was quite provocative like I said stop it matar and all this heavy or Tibetan music or koto and flute all kinds of interesting musical journeys that you go on as you were breathing now Christina who came from a different place she came from Hawaii and she was a follower of Swami Muktananda and she had had an enlightenment experience in a car crash she had a near-death experience and left her body and during this um, experience when she left her body she could hear police sirens and she heard the radio saying <clears throat> we're going to use the jaws of life to save somebody on the freeway who's just crashed her car which was her and in this crash of her car which was the car was totaled and smushed Nothing happened except she had her little toe amputated. She came out of that accident and eventually found her way to this ashram. And it's a long story, but she had this full blown enlightenment experience. And she at the time was a school teacher and she loved art therapy. She was an artist. So she and Stan decided that one of the ways to capture your experience of holotropic breath work would be through drawing mandalas. Now, a mandala is a circle, and it, they would present you with a circle about the size of a 78 record, because that's how they drew it, put the record on there and drew around it, okay, on a piece of paper, and they would give you colored crayons or colored pencils, I think it was crayons actually, but I'm not sure, it's been a long time, and you would do the breathing, and then you would do the drawings, and then the drawings would be placed around the room, and then you would contemplate what what your experience was what the drawing means other people might comment on it became a very interesting process and so the first day that i did this i thought it was very pleasant i felt that i connected with my father who was on the other side and it was very pleasant it was very nice they did have a philosophy behind their breathing experiences and they said that and and this has been disputed in hot debate but they Stan and Christina believe that you make a lot of hypnotic decisions in the in womb, in the womb, pre and perinatal, and that those decisions are based on your birthing experience. And they categorized four phases of birth. The first phase of birth is you're in a womb without a view. Okay. <laughs> you're just hanging out in your mom, and your life attitude that goes with it is that you're floating around. And it's kind of peaceful and relaxed and you're feeling good and everything's fine, except the negative spin on this is if your mother's taking drugs or your mother uh, has put you in danger, let's say somebody's trying to abort you or something, then you start feeling like a victim. So that would be phase one. So you might want to write that down. That is the life attitude is either relaxed or danger and it is a womb with lots of room and you're floating around the next birth experience they say the next life attitude came from the womb with no with no room because now you're getting cramped in there and as you're getting cramped you're starting to notice you have limits which could be a good or bad thing but it could be very constraining and it could feel like you have no exit and it's helpless and hopeless and trapped or you could feel kind of mellow and blissful. Depends on the spin that you gave it at that time. The next one is the cervix is opening and your mother is pushing you. Now, what you may not realize is every time your mother has a contraction, you have 40 pounds of pressure on your little head. 40 pounds of pressure pushed on your head, which actually stimulates consciousness, they said because the bones in your skull are flexible and they kind of collapse and your head gets a little bit molded or collapsed as you're going through that birth canal. And the good news is that you and your mother are cooperating. You're a team. There's a great team effort. You're going for it. You know, you're a survivor. You know, you are persistent. You're just enjoying the experience of working with your mom through labor, through the birth canal. The downside is also, you know, struggle, rage, feeling angry because you're hurt. It, it's not pleasant to have your head crushed. 
So those are a, a third phase. And then the fourth phase was nirvana. And that's you're born. You know, you have deliverance. They deliver you. Dar la luz. You're given the light. And in that moment when you're given the light, you might feel that you won. I won. I'm here. I'm succeeding. I'm joyful. And everybody's happy to see me. And I triumphed. Or you might feel, wow, that was awful. And nobody wants me. Nobody's looking at me. Nobody's holding me. How many of you have remembered your birth, by the way? Raise your hand if you remembered your birth. I remember every single minute of my birth, every single moment, but it didn't happen this way for me. So I just want you to know that this is a theory and it doesn't fit with my personal information. I had a completely different experience. I've regressed thousands of people to their birth and it doesn't necessarily fit with the thousands of people I've regressed to the birth. One time I regressed a mother and triplets at the same time, and they all relived the same birth, but they all had completely different experiences of that birth. And they all made different decisions at birth about how they would be in life. And in that case, the decisions they made carried through to the time that I met them. And those decisions were quite different one from the other. So I'm just presenting to you Stan and Christina's theory. That theory didn't really hold water for me because I was just there because I had lost twins and I wanted to just feel good. I went to Esalen to go play or something. Well, as luck would have it, um, they, did, they, they carefully told us no drugs are allowed at Esalen and no LSD, no drugs. So before we were having our, a big session that was going to happen the next day, I was in the meeting room early because I'm always eager. And there were three other people with me in the meeting room. And in wanders a guy who is in the class and he has taken LSD and he is freaking out. He is having a bad trip as they called it. And he was absolutely hallucinating and freaking out. Word was sent to Stan and Christina Groff, who refused to come to the room. They said, let Shelly take care of it. They did not want to have any kind of problems with Esalen or drugs at Esalen because of the laws and because of their background with LSD experimentation. So I was in a room with a guy throwing things around, yelling and screaming and paranoid and freaking out. Now, at the time, I was just studying hypnosis, so I felt okay that I could handle it. I let one person stay and the other one or two that was there left, and I was alone with this guy for about three hours. I hypnotized him, calmed him down, and finally he chilled out. And then Stan and Christina came in and they became my best friends because I rescued them from a very tricky situation. And we became friends after that. The very following day, we had a sustained breathing session. It was supposed to be, I think, three to five hours. I'm not sure. But an amazing thing happened to me personally. I was doing the breathing and it was, got very, very uncomfortable. And suddenly I felt like a band was around my head there were bands at my wrists and at my feet. You have a sitter sitting next to you when you breathe. And I know that I must have been scooting around on the floor, but I was completely in an altered state. And the thing that happened next was stunning. The, all those bands popped and I flew out of my body. And I'd like you to think for a minute about the biggest orgasm of your life. Everybody thinking of the biggest orgasm, the best orgasm you've ever had. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, good. If you haven't had one, imagine the best one you ever had times a thousand. That's what it was like. I was completely beyond ecstatic and I was flying up to an orb of light. And it was a full-blown, absolute, complete enlightenment experience, and I've never been the same since. As I was flying up to the orb of light, 
I looked down and below me were all of these figures wearing white robes in a circle holding hands. They were not male or female. They were endogenous and they were holding hands in the circle. And I knew in my heart that that was humanity. And then I looked up toward the orb of light and I met God. Now, this is my God that I met. You'll probably meet your own in your own enlightenment experience. God was a woman and she looked like the Statue of Liberty. And I said to myself, first thought, God is a woman and she looks like the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> But I proceeded to fly around her and in this still blissful, unbelievable, orgasmic state of mind. And then I had my second thought. My second thought was, what about the twins? And my hand went out and a baby landed on my hand. And my other hand went out and another baby landed on my hand. And I flew around this orb of light holding these babies. And then the babies got very, very big and one put their hand out and the other put their hand out and they flew me around. It was earth shattering for me, life changing. All I could think of, I've got to get out of this room with this music and all this stuff going on. I've got to go outside. So I remember sitting upright and thinking, get me out of this room. And I remember Christine Negroff coming to me and saying, Shelly, come back slowly. My sitter went with me and I went outside and I suddenly was doing all these mudras spontaneously, mudras I never knew. I didn't even know what a mudra was. And I had this sublime experience that I had to look at the sun or talk to the sun. But I was careful not to look directly at the sun, but look to the side of the sun. And I was doing these mudras. And then I looked at my sitter and I could see their aura completely. I knew exactly all the colors. I could see their relatives. I could see the auras on trees. I could see the molecules in every flower, every rock, and every stone. I was changed forever. I have never been the same since. I am very psychic now. Maybe I was before. I see auras whenever I choose. I can see deceased people behind you and around you. I um, went home. I called all my friends together and my husband and I said, I have to tell you about this experience. They all listened. They all had tears in their eyes and they said, we don't know what the hell you're talking about, but we're really happy for you. I remember about three days later, I was driving my car and there was a beautiful sunset over the Pacific Ocean and I pulled my car off the road and parked and I became the sunset and had a secondary residual enlightenment experience based on the first one. I have since over these many, many years, because that was what 1960, let me see, that was 19... 68 maybe I um, then I started doing holotropic sessions with people I joined the holotropic society and it is by far the most powerful tool I know it shouldn't be taken lightly people will go into enlightenment experiences and they may experience the kundalini as I described it which could look like a psychotic break and if you haven't ever had this happen in your office, it may, just with plain hypnosis. Do not call 911. Do not send people to the loony bin. Because when they come out the other side of an enlightenment experience, they are transformed for the good. It is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me spiritually. I'll never forget any bit of it. Since then, I've remembered every moment of my own birth, but not in those breathing exercises. I've done these sessions with hundreds of people. I remember once I did a session with about eight people in my living room, and all of a sudden there was this god-awful smell of, of um, what's it called? They, they give it to you, put you to sleep. It's E-T-H. Um, ether. Ether. 
this guy started smelling like ether. And that's because he had had a very traumatic experience that he was reliving of being given ether for something or other. And the ether came out of his body. I mean, it filled the room. We were all smelling ether. It was very strange. A cigarette smoker might completely detoxify. Now, not everybody has a, a wild experience, but it's nonverbal, so you're not sure what's happening. They may cry or laugh, but you don't know if they're happy or sad. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, when they draw their mandalas and they talk about it, then you enter into the realm of art and expression and you start to learn what the journey was. I remember once I regressed a pilot for TWA and he reached out and, I, and he wanted to hold me. I was a sitter and he kept holding me and rocking and rocking and crying and crying and crying. I had no idea what was happening, but you know, you yield to the experience of the client. And afterwards he told me that he got to meet his mother and he was holding his mother in heaven. And he was having a full blown experience of loving his mother who was an angel in heaven. So I'm telling you this experience, a very personal and very meaningful experience to me, but holotropic breathing is something to consider. It's not to be taken lightly. The music's very important. It can change everything. You start with strong music and you wind up with gentle and kindly music. Now, a few people don't go anywhere. I remember one fellow in Hawaii when I was doing holotropic sessions there. I've done them in Japan and other countries, but in Hawaii, this one fellow, every time you do a holotropic session with a group, He'd say, oh, this sucks. I'm leaving. And he'd leave. And he kept leaving. And then finally, after about four different times that we'd have a session and he'd leave, he came back and he said, this is what I have to learn. This is how I do my life. I leave every situation. I never, ever take the time to face myself. And so then the next breathing experience, he did face himself. So that's kind of the rundown. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you would like to ask me about the experience. Michael. I'm ready. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny, as, as, you, as you tell the story, I, I really was uh, introduced into all of the sort of world of the, the new age uh, through Ram Das, and, and, then, and then these other connections sort of showed up because it's a huge web, as you, as you know. Um, and what I remember was Ram Das had said something about LSD, LSD experience, and he said LSD wasn't the answer. He said, but what it was, was it something, it was something that made us aware of some of the possibilities. And, and, and uh, it, here's what I noticed based on what you have said here today is that Morris Netherton, some people know Morris Netherton, past life, uh, past life therapy, wrote a book. Uh, his approach to past life regression involves connected breathing or, or something very similar to, I don't know if it's the same, but very similar to allotropic breathing. Sandra Ray's work with rebirthing. Rebirthing, uh, very similar. Yeah. Very similar. And, and, uh, and uh, I was first introduced to uh, the, the Bhagwan uh, through uh, uh, chaotic breathing meditation. Uh, which wasn't quite the same, but it was it was it was uh, breathing outside of the expected pattern, uh, and uh, and connected as it was as well. It was it was a continuous breathing process that would go on for some hours and would would produce profound altered states, you know, uh, in people. So so there seems to be this connection, uh, and it looks like uh, like the graphs are kind of the earliest place in the, in the name of the names that I've certainly mentioned, uh, where, you know, where this happens. I, I also suspect, and, and you can probably tell me this, I suspect that there may even be some ancient origin to this uh, as well, uh, as a, a vehicle for, for getting into altered states. And, and you mentioned the Kundalini, uh, for instance. Well, I don't know that there was a connection that I've ever read about between the breathing and the Kundalini. I know that hypnosis was written about 5,000 years ago, in the Iris Papyrus or the Ebers Papyrus, that there was a hypnosis formula. Mm -hmm. And what that formula was, if you're interested, was you place, you do the prayer, the sacred prayer. We don't know what that was. Then you place a boy upon the stone and you yell, hooey, 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 eight times. And he will do as he is told. That was the one, one of the original hypnotic formulas ever written 
5,000 years ago. <laughs> I know, I know I, if somebody I, did that with me, I would do whatever they said. Because... <laughs> <laughs> you know but, you know, I, I know that you all know this too. When you're doing a massage or when you're doing yoga, you're doing breathing patterns, especially if you do yoga. And those are very old traditions. So I would reckon that there was some connection, but I don't know it myself. Yeah. But it was a very, very wonderful time. I was in the generation lost in space. I was very happy to have been a child of that time. It was a great life and a great time. And I feel kind of sad for the children today because they missed it. I really feel sad for them because it was amazing. And Esalen was a place to go with no limits to explore consciousness. People were themselves. They, you'd see people doing, you know, embrace the tiger and do, doing all kinds of dances on the lawn. You'd see um, people worked in the gardens. Everybody volunteered to do part, take their part in the Esalen experience. And um, I never really got to teach there, though I would have liked to, but I was so busy with my hypnosis practice and they did not, they did not encourage hypnosis. They were not favorite, favorite of hypnosis. And I was very proud to be a hypnotherapist. And so Anytime I would come with a book or mention that I was a hypnotist, they go, that's nice. It was just, it wasn't really, they were psychologists primarily, but I did do a lot of speaking at the humanistic psychology conventions. And I would then speak about hypnosis, but Esalen did not encourage hypnosis. They were not lovers of hypnosis. Not when I was there. Yes, Karen. You got to unmute yourself there. Hypnosis by any other name? Well, it's all hypnosis, yeah. Karen. So, of course, yeah, but so. you know, I mean, obviously, it's all hypnosis, and a lot of the greats that we learned from, and NLP is just a knockoff of the names that Michael listed, and they just took all their different techniques and called it hypnosis or NLP, neuro linguistic psychology or programming or whatever they called it. So you know, everything was a knockoff that sprung from this kind of moment in time and um you know i met a lot of the people who lived there i i actually had a boyfriend for a while who lived at esalen so i would go up and just play at esalen so i had a lot a lot of fun at esalen and uh, it's a beautiful place the big sur is very very beautiful and years later i actually uh, had had a friend who had a house on the top of one of the hills overlooking Esalen, um, very wealthy people. And so I could go there and be treated like a queen and look down on this, you know, hippie community, which was also fun. So that's my story. <laughs> that's great. Any other questions? I have a question here. Yes. Um, when you were had the uh, vision and flying up and seeing the Statue of Liberty and all that, was was the, uh, the hip, the hollow tropic breathing thing really open-ended so that it wasn't any kind of you know you, you went on your own pace and what happened happened or was there some, some kind of uh, you know stimulation for that to happen no it just happened from the breathing and the music and i didn't expect it to happen because the other experiences that i had were just cute little moments where oh i saw my dad in heaven you know i mean it didn't feel like anything very profound until bang those those bands popped wow. and I, I i just it was it, it was truly life-changing i had done other things i could have been in flotation tanks and i'd done right. nothing i mean they were fine they're all great yeah. but that was and and if if i could say there's one thing and it's not it's not rebirthing breathing which i've done it's not anything but holotropic breathing because it is so sustained and so intense and you want to have do it with someone who's with you. And, and after you're done, you don't tell them how it is. They tell you how it is because so, so, they're the guru and you're not. You're so just there, was, there wasn't really a, a, 
a precedent experience for you before that? Like I had an LSD trip, so I kind of. No, I never did this. LSD. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I wasn't a druggie. I, I wouldn't take any drugs because I was very pure. You know, I just wasn't into it. So this was this was the uh, maybe it's the same as the LSDs. That's what Stan said. But for me, it wasn't because I didn't have that to compare it to. So um, as, as, as you were talking, Shelley, about about that adventure, it, it certainly sounded like an LSD experience. I, I, I've, I've heard about, read about, been told about <laughs> such experiences and uh, and absolutely, uh, you know, something that was so familiar to me, except that there was the, the idea that this actually wasn't stimulated by, you know, by some chemical agent, but, uh, you know, is 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 what's amazing uh it suggests to me by the way that what lsd does is it is it turns on a natural response it isn't the acid that does it uh, other than that it initiates a sequence you know and but but in any case i i did a thing i i did a thing and i guess it was probably rebirthing i'm going to ask you to get clear with me about the distinction but but it was connected breathing and i made a recording uh, it's interesting that you said the Stavat Mater, by the way, I, I, it, it, that that just blasted out of my past. And, and for those who don't know, this is just just to tell you what this is, um, the, the lyrics, it's, it, the Latin translated into English, it's a, it's a monastic song about the Virgin Mary uh, watching her son die on the cross, you know, uh, at the cross, her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping where he hung the dying Lord. It is it is this, you know, this is this is big stuff you know uh, the recording that i made i didn't really know what i was doing so uh, and, and 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 that tends to give rise to some creative stuff and what i did was i thought what i really would like to do is to do this connected breathing and have it carry me through a variety of different emotional experiences and so i had everything from the night on bald mountain to and and, and the, uh, the 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 great gate in Ki at kiev and and uh, 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 what's the um, uh, uh, symphony fantastique so there's a, a hanging and stuff but then i also had some really beautiful things and in fact i have uh, it, it it ends with eric clapton playing danny boy on an acoustic guitar so so <laughs> one of the things michael is that when i play the music specific holotropic mu music which i which i you know stan and christina groff helped me to commandeer this you don't have lyrics ever there are no well, lyrics. I didn't. Yeah, I did not. Just the music. Yeah. And you don't want music that's familiar to the people. Mm -hmm. You want music that is foreign to them so that it's, it takes them where it takes them. Yeah. And it, it does in some way influence where they go, of sure. course. Sure. However, I am taking people on a vision quest with James Wanless uh, next month. And when we go on that vision quest, I'm going to play native american music because they're going to go into the altered state of that that's going to be a, a, a suggestion so the music is suggestive for sure and especially if you know the words that's not good because we want you to be open-ended mm -hmm. uh, and also when you come out which i didn't do that mind-blowing experience but when you come out and you draw your mandala the mandalas are magnificent that people draw and it gives you even more insight into what just happened for you. And it's all, it's art therapy. So we're combining um, breath work, art therapy and music therapy mm -hmm. in a controlled environment where you're protected because you're gonna scoot around the floor. You're gonna drool, you're gonna, nose will run. I mean, all kinds of stuff and your sitter is wiping your nose or doing whatever and they're sliding you around. And, it's a very earthy, gutsy experience, but if you wanna push the limit, see the problem with LSD or these drugs is it can open the door to enlightenment, but it can also slam it shut and make you nuttier than a fruitcake. And that's why I don't recommend it personally. I really discourage it. The ayahuasca, the, and I don't care what anybody says to me, I don't think that's healthy. But Ram Das, who you brought up, stopped using yeah. LSD because he didn't need it anymore. He said it was within him to have these experiences. And I concur. These yeah. experiences are part of you. 
you came here knowing this and it's the it's similar to a near death experience or a dear death experience where you open to a vaster wisdom that is intrinsic to your you you mean you are the light you are the laughter you are the happily ever after and this is just a way to put put yourself in balance perhaps you know ram das was very curious about the implications of lsd and 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 when he met his guru it was one of the first questions that he wanted to ask he wanted to know about tell, tell me about this these pills you know uh and the guru knew that the question was coming. So basically uh, the guru said to him, you wanted to ask me about some medicine. And Ram Das gave him a handful of LSD. I mean, like, like 20 hits or something of, of LSD. And the guru took them and he just swallowed them all and continued to lecture and was not in any way phased or changed or affected by it whatsoever, which was, which was a realization for Ram Das that, that, oh God, the guru is already there. You know, we're, we're using these agents to try to get to this place. Uh, and yeah. yeah, yeah, so. Uh, well, you know, I, I've been very fortunate living in this time frame because I got to see a lot of very powerful um, people like um, Krishnamurti and um, Swami Muktananda and all of these interesting characters. And um, not all of them are enlightened. Hmm. Some of them are phony balonies. Hmm. Muktananda was a phony baloney. And in my, in my mind, he was a phony baloney. And it's very interesting when you venture into the realm of this heightened awareness and you've had the Kundalini awakening and you're spiritually open the world is a different place and really nothing can hurt me <laughs> I'll to say that yeah. you know freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose you know i would, I would lose. say too shelly that maybe maybe each of these is an, a means to an end you found as luck would have it you found this route to enlightenment Maybe some people had to take the LSD route or the ayahuasca route. Absolutely. They maybe they should. And maybe they did. But I also know people who took the LSD or the ayahuasca are nuttier than a fruitcake in her right. mental hospitals. And that's the risk. That's a Russian roulette. And that's why I don't recommend it. It's yeah. dangerous because you don't know if your brain will freeze or fry or, or be open. And that's the problem. And that's why I think it's risky business. And I work a lot with druggies here in California. And I just, I do everything I can to discourage them from using hallucinogenics and drugs. I just do that because that's what I believe. Yeah. I, I wonder if you can help us sort of connect the, the dots here because <clears throat> we talked about holotropic breathing as sort of a vehicle that that gets this thing starting started and then at the same time you were telling us about an experience of flying around the statue of liberty you know etc so so is is there a place where the breathing stops and then this no the, they, they 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 keep telling you to keep breathing like when the bands popped and this was happening they kept tapping me which it was the signal to breathe so i continued the breathing and, and then finally, I just went, I can't do this. I've got to go outside. And when I went outside, everything in the world was different and it has never been the same. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I don't know what else to say. I can, I can, when I'm in an altered state in my work and I look at a client, I can see, I can see through their body. I can see their heart beating. I can see the blood flowing. I can, I have x-ray vision. You guys are going to think I'm not here to fruitcake, but I have x-ray vision and I can, I can, when, when I'm channeling my guides, I can see through their bodies. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting thing. I have, I have opened my mental eye, my third eye somehow through this experience. And this was a long time ago. I'm, you know, I'm 76 now. And, you know, never went away, never went away this awareness. Wow. So if, if you want to push the rubber wall sometime, find a way to do holotropic breathing in a safe place with safe people and see what happens. It's, it's amazing.
Can you, can you show us the breathing one more time? So, so we really understand. Yeah, there's two ways to do it. You can either breathe in the nose and out the mouth. Everybody try that in the nose and out the mouth. And you feel a little lightheaded, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll try it another way because you're going to do it the way that's most comfortable for you. This time you're going to breathe in the mouth and out the nose. Here we go. You decide, is that more comfortable than the other one? Or I found it was most comfortable to breathe in the mouth and out the mouth. So it was. Now, the breathing is long inhalation and long exhalation, but no pausing. It is linked breath. It is linked and sustained. So it's. Mm -hmm. And you do that for an hour, and believe me, you're going to have an experience. You already feel for, lightheaded. I did it for 20 hours, and at the end of it, I had an experience, and she was eight pounds and seven ounces. <laughs> <laughs> and they that's felt. true. That's true. That's why the breathing when you're birthing is really important. They called it Lamaze then, but it sounds very much, Shelly, like what you're talking about. And, and once it became a hypnotist, I said, well, that was just hypnosis. With and a lot of people who've had babies had enlightenment experience while they were giving birth. They were flying with the angels. Not unusual. I did that for 22 hours. I was in this, the uh, final stage, the pushing phase of labor for five hours. And that's the hardest form of labor. And I don't, it was so easy. It was yeah. last, contractions would last 90 seconds. In between, it was about five to 15 seconds. And her father told me, you would go right out to sleep in between contractions. Nice, nice. Contraction was the signal to breathe again. And it was just a perfect, wonderful. Beautiful, birth. beautiful. Yeah. I used hypnosis and I was 36 hours laboring when my son was born. And um, so I was very relaxed, but I had to have a C-section in the end because the doctor said she's dying. And I thought, I'm not dying. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just relaxing. <laughs> I guess my vital signs were dropping or who knows what, but anyway. <laughs> yes, Paul. How often, how often do you find yourself kind of defaulting into doing that kind of breathing or just saying, hey, I'm doing this kind of breathing or I just have I to I don't be do it conscious. anymore. Are I never do it anymore. Okay. It doesn't matter. Like doing it right now was kind of a sentimental journey because I do not do that breathing anymore. I don't feel like I need to. Just like Ram Dass didn't need to do his LSD anymore. I don't think it's necessary. I feel like I opened the door of light and it's always there. I just have to open the door and it's waiting for me. Do you teach it still, shall I? I do sometimes. I've never taught it at a conference. I've never done it at a hypnosis conference, but I probably should. Um, and, you know, it would be a, it would have to be at least a two day experience. And, and I would have to have somebody assist me because I don't, I wouldn't want a room full of people th th without assistance. Yeah. But it would be, it would be a really interesting thing to do at a conference. Because it like it a is, wonderful post-conference for next year's Return to Life Mid-America Conference. It might be. It, it is by far the most powerful tool I know. So, yes. Ladies Paul. and gentlemen, you heard us here on yeah, the is, virtual chat. Okay. Paul? Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, you, you mentioned sitter, and I don't really know what the setup is. And what's the role of having every, every, has, every, every person there has his or her own personal sitter i mean what what's, what happens what's, what's is you pal with? up in twos and you take turns being the sitter for the other person now you don't have to do it that way but it's really nice to have one person tending to you rather than two leaders running around a room trying to tend to you you have somebody sitting and they just meditate they're just in countenance they're just present there's nothing big nothing dramatic is happening from their point of view they just see somebody breathing and maybe making some sounds or moving around or laughing or crying, but they don't know what's happening. There's no dialogue. There's no exchange. You just sit in countenance and then you, you reverse it. 
So that's how you would do it in partnerships. Yeah. And that adds um, security then, right? You've got, so you've got somebody there if something goes. Yeah. Well, you always have, you have somebody there with you and then they call the instructors over if there's, so when I was scooting around the floor and then sitting up, I obviously they must've called Christina over to me when she came and said, come back slowly. And she really didn't want me to leave the room, but there was nobody going to keep me in that room anymore. There was just no way I was going to be in that room. I had to be with the son. So, you know, it was just, uh, it was a divine calling for me to do that. It's also very interesting that as you describe this deep level of trippiness, <laughs> right? Or whatever you want to call it, you still were fully you. You said, I can't be here anymore. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. I'm leaving the room. Mm -hmm. Kind of shows, doesn't it, that we really have control of our mind? Yes, and that's very well said. And, you know, I think, I think I was more me then than I ever was. I think most of what I was before wasn't, it was a, a Patty knows what I'm going to talk about. It was the tree of life, right? It was all the hypnosis that had gone around the core essence of me. And so, you know, I was now my essential self nice. and not the masks that we wear for each other and the way we try to pretend and, you know, we're always trying to do it right and be good little boys and girls. But, you know, there is an essential you that goes beyond words and is profoundly amazing. And that's what I go for in all my work. That's why I call myself a transpersonal hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, you know, in the, in the early days, people didn't want me to talk about spiritual stuff. No, that was just taboo. So I just kept my mouth shut. And then I went to the National Guild one year and I put signs all over saying free channeling demonstration. And I had 150 people show up and I did a channeling for them and blew them out of the water. And, you know, after that, they kind of were, oh, OK, maybe she could do that again. But that's weird, you know, kind of thing. They didn't like me very much, though. It's, seriously, it's funny. There, there really is that that that, that for a long time, and I, I can remember this too. That in hypnosis circles, you didn't talk about certain things. That was just too weird, uh, uh, especially spiritual. Said God, the G word, you, you know, or, or any of that stuff. And on the other hand, in religious circles, you didn't talk about hypnosis either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they weren't cross referenced properly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Competing, they're competing entities. Well, and, and of course they are, because religion certainly has a lot to do with altered states. So, you know, this is a whole other discussion that we could have. A whole other discussion. I, my my assistant was a nun, and her husband was a priest, and I heard all about how they very carefully made sure that everything was hypnotic during the set during the services. Yeah. All very carefully calculated. It always place. is, whether they calculated or not. I mean, there's this the was calculated in Louisiana. It was calculated. Yeah, yeah. And Mary ba Mary Baker Eddy in the Foundation of Christian Science. Yeah, there's a whole chapter in that book about avoiding uh, about animal magnetism, which was what she called hypnosis. But in she knocked off her book from a hypnotist. Well, well, of course she did. Of course she did. She, she, she copied it she, and it went to court in New York City and it was proven that she plagiarized the entire book. Yeah. Well, that's why she didn't want people to study hypnosis because they might run across that book. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Interesting. Well, how lovely. So, so uh, anybody questions? We've got we've got only about eight minutes left, Shelley. This has been the fastest hour and a half that we've had. Paul, yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, I, just in terms of um, the competition for different uh, trainings or sticks about breathing. Is there any, anything else that's coming that's coming up that's trying to take on? holotropic breathing and be well that was then this is now this is bigger and better i mean yes yeah, sir well i would say yogic breathing is now very popular and so if you'll probably anytime you go any to any yoga class they're going to have you do different breathing patterns and some are focused very much on breathing so i would say there are some yogic studies that focus on breath work I don't know exactly what you call them or what the names of those are, 
but I do know that there's some that focus specifically on breathing. There's some that focus on hot, you're in a hot room, or some focus on deprivation, or there's all kinds of things. Gloria, do you have your hand up? You're muted, Gloria. Gloria's muted. Gloria? Hold on. Gloria, gonna unmute you. There, there you go. go. I just want to tell you that I, I think this was the most wonderful, wonderful presentation and the way you are allowing the spirituality to come into it. Because I have to tell you, I learned spiritual hypnosis when I was 23 years old. And I did it. I go in and out of hospitals and all kinds of things like that. And I did it until 1995 when I saw an ad in the paper and I went and I became certified with IAC. And I've always been very quiet about it because I thought I'm really not supposed to do it, but I do it. And Congratulations, even, good for you. When I do straight hypnosis with people, many times the last thing I do is I throw the spiritual component in them and I just let them tap with their higher self and give their higher self permission to give them whatever it is they need. Beautiful. So my, I have a program called the Stockwell oh. Method and I teach my students higher self hypnosis. And I will tell you how I do that, which might be interesting to you. I always do an, an, a first interview, an out of trance interview, then I put them in a trance and I do an in-trance interview with the higher self on the same topic. So I immediately yeah. cut to the higher self so that the higher self, the all-knowing self, I say it, the all-knowing self, there's a part of you that's wise beyond wise. Will that part speak to me? They'll nod their head. You heard the conversation we had a few minutes ago. What would you like to say about it? And then they will reveal all that they want to say about it. So I, I call my approach higher self hypnosis. I love it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, how lovely. Okay. Well, it was a pleasure. I certainly enjoyed being here. And I um, loved having you, of course. It was so fun. <laughs> and uh, I'll come back another time and tell you some other cool stuff. And I look forward to it. That is great. And I was talking to you guys about uh, Mid-America. Uh, Shelly will be doing some spiritual hypnosis there. Randy Light, who, can I say, is a Shelly disciple? She's okay. my student. She's one of my <laughs> students. <laughs> uh, Randy will be doing spiritual hypnosis as well uh, at Mid-America. So there'll be a lot of that going on there as well. And we don't, we're not afraid to talk about it anymore. No. No, because... Uh, we still frown on hypnotizing chickens, but we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other story. Another day we'll talk about that. <laughs> I say if you can hypnotize chickens and bring uh, TV cameras out to watch you do it, more power to you. Get them. Listen, marketing. I went Associated <laughs> Press hypnotizing chickens. I was on David Letterman. Hey, don't knock the rock. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Shelly, how can we get in touch with you if we want to follow up on any of this? So first of all, please write this down. Go on Facebook. Because of Michael, we have a Facebook page also, which is like the virtual chapter, but it's called Free Hypnosis-IHF. And there's wonderful interviews with people like Michael and Karen and all kinds of wonderful people, Patty, Scott, and just wonderful Grant has been on there, Grant Morell. And so please check that out. And every Thursday we have a forum. You're welcome to join us. It's at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And it, you can go to freehypnosis-ihf and get the code for Zoom. And join us this particular Thursday, which is in two days. The theme is secrets. So if you want to talk about some secrets or if you just want to listen and be present, it's a cool forum and it, it goes out to thousands of people. Literally thousands are watching this show now. And that's one thing. And also you can email me at IHF at Cox.net. IHF at Cox.net. I love that. C-O-X, not C-O-C-K. We were talking about chickens before. I just wanted to make C-O-X. Sure. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> IHF at COX.net. And I'd love to hear from you. And 
and particularly, I'd love to have you share your enlightenment experiences with me. I'm always very interested. Patty, you want to say something, dear? Yeah, it just occurred to me. I wanted to mention the uh, the spiritual certification that I was a part of that you did a while back. And I know you're doing those still. Do you have any of those coming up? The yes, let me spiritual tell you about counselor? that. That's, okay. That was an this amazing This is an amazing class. thing. Kathy Kennedy and I, and Patty took this class with us, we created a 50-hour class that's on a thumb drive. You plug it into your computer and you go through 50 hours of training to be a transpersonal or a spiritual counselor. And we certify you as a spiritual counselor. Yeah, the cost is $14.97. It includes membership in IHF. It includes certification. And it's a wonderful, wonderful course. And um, I, I can't praise it enough because we spent six months to make it the most amazing course ever. And it's highly experiential. Well, it was fun, wasn't it, Patty? I loved it because it was so outside of any box that anybody could possibly you know, think of. And it, it just, it, I was in a point where I needed something. I wanted something very different. I was going through kind of a phase and oh my goodness, that showed up. And I took that, that training was, it just blew my mind in so many different directions. It really was, it was so cool. I can't even say enough. It more. comes on one of these. And you plug it in and it has the book, Spiritual Counselor Secrets, and it has 50 hours of training. So you don't take up all your memory. You have it from here and you can take the class. That's not exactly the one we have. Ours has our picture on it, but nice. it's a it's a cool class. Great. Well, that sounds lovely. Uh, we, we have we're, we have run out of time. It's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so so here's what I want to want to remind everybody. First of all, don't forget to get your CEUs. Okay, just a little housekeeping here uh, and uh, all these great things coming up. Remember Mid-America this weekend and, and uh, the master trainer training coming up uh, in November. And, uh, and, and what I really like to think about the chapter is I hope that we have inspired you and given you something that you can you know, put into practice. I think you should always should learn something from the chapter and put it into practice as soon as possible. So right now I am debating within myself about what I'm going to do tomorrow, because it's either going to be holotropic breathing or naked volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure I that yet, but I, I really appreciate this. I, I love you guys. Uh, so everybody, we're, we're going to open up, uh, open up your microphones now so we can all uh, wish, uh, send, send Shelly our uh, blessings and thanks and appreciation as we log off. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys uh, next time. Uh, so we'll be back this time next month don't miss it don't miss it or remember to be here that was a thank you karen and michael for this wonderful forum it's just we so love you. cool so shelly cl close your eyes and receive it okay yeah. thank you so much shelly thank, thank you thank you very much You're beautiful beautiful, beautiful. Good job. thanks for sharing see you this weekend see you friday that was amazing thank you thanks everybody see you next month